welcome to today's Raleigh City Council meeting. Um, we are going to start with um, the consent agenda. Um, one item has been pulled. That is um, by Councillor Fort, J2, no parking zones, Trenton Woods Way. Councillor Fort. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor. We, uh, I did ask for that item to be pulled and be considered after we go through uh, public hearing. I have several constituents who want to speak on the matter. Okay, during um, the public comment period, correct? Yes, that's correct, ma'am. All right, we will take this up after public comment then. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda minus J2? Um, thank you, um, Council Member Stewart. Do I have a second? Um, Councilor Branch. All in favor, please raise your hands. Okay, clerk, that was unanimous. All right, the next item then will be public comment. Just want to remind everybody the rules of decorum. Um, please say it every time, but um, I'm hoping with the spirit of Dr. King, we actually remember some of these words with, about love versus hatred and kindness. Um, we can all ag agree to disagree, but let's do so respectfully. Um, first, we'll hear from Michael Pendergrass. Hi, my name is Michael Pendergrass and I live at 3015 Brentwood Road here in Raleigh. I've lived in the Triangle for about 25 years and in Brentwood for the last 10. And I came here today to talk to you about the proposed Brentwood traffic calming project. The traffic on Brentwood Road is atrocious compared to other residential streets in the area. The street is used as a regular cut through between Capitol Boulevard and New Hope Church Road. And if I had to guess, I would say at least 70% of the traffic that we see is through traffic, not neighborhood residents. The people who use Brentwood as a cut through are not responsible or courteous drivers. The posted speed limit is 25 miles an hour and people regularly do 50. At least once a month, someone will pass me on a two lane residential street with double yellow lines. I get passed by people who want me to go faster. I have regular daily traffic of 18 wheelers and dump trucks driving by my house. The speed bumps help somewhat but most of the people just try and see how fast they can go in between them. And twice I have needed to render first aid to someone in my front yard because of a T-bone accident on the corner. The last time that happened was the week before Christmas. The proposed project would either reduce or completely remove those issues and improve the safety of our neighborhood. As a parent, I appreciate the safety and as a homeowner and someone who works from home, in an office that fronts Brentwood Road, I would appreciate the reduced traffic noise and just the overall reduction in traffic. I understand that during the normal process, we didn't receive the required response rate for approval, but this year has been anything but normal. The planning process occurred during a pandemic. The vote for approval happened during a very busy election process. This isn't anyone's fault. It's just bad luck and timing. But the votes we did get were overwhelmingly in favor of the project. I hope you'll all be willing to grant us an exception to the process and start the project as soon as feasible. And I did wanna say a, spe a specific thanks to David Cox for helping, helping us bring this to y'all today. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Michael. Next we have Bridget O'Boyle. Hello, thank you for having me. My name is Bridget O'Boyle. I live at 3401 Mason Place, which is in the Brentwood neighborhood. And I'm also here to talk about the Brentwood traffic calming. I'm a Raleigh native. I was born and raised in Raleigh. I've lived in about seven neighborhoods around Raleigh and my husband and I moved to Brentwood this summer. Brentwood's an incredible neighborhood. The park that the city has been improving highlights the family aspect of our neighborhood that we have come to love. But like Michael just said, I have never experienced traffic in a neighborhood like I have on Brentwood Road. I would say at least two times a month, I am passed across the double yellow or confronted with headlights in my lane as someone else is being passed 
and that's in broad daylight. At night, it's faster, it's scarier, it's louder. Just two weeks ago, there was a horrific accident on Brentwood, not Brentwood in Capitol, but Brentwood in our neighborhood. People in the street injured multiple cars. It was really scary and eye-opening. While I'm disappointed that there are rally citizens who act this way that don't have any regard for public safety, they're not really my concern. My concern are really my neighbors, my neighbor's kids who are learning how to ride bikes, wiggling in strollers, walking to the park. My neighbors that are doing yard work as a car passes their house at 50 or 60 miles per hour. It sounds like an exaggeration, but it's not. I have stopped wearing headphones on walks. I feel like I need to hear the cars. I need to hear the screeching tires as someone almost gets rear-ended as they're passed, leading up to or right after one of those speed humps. I just really want my neighborhood to feel like I live in the city of Raleigh, because right now it doesn't. The city has already done the hard work, the traffic study, the plans for the traffic calming. They solved the issue of Brentwood Road being such a straightaway cut through. But sending out a ballot in only English to a bilingual neighborhood in the middle of election season when our mailbox were flooded with everyday mail and every candidate's mail of every candidate that was on the ballot, they just got lost. It wasn't really enough. Um, the studies have proven that our neighborhood needs this. And my ask is really that we can go ahead and approve it. I, I'm really worried that if it's not approved, if we don't start implementing, we'll be back and it will eventually be approved, but it'll be at the cost of another accident, another serious accident, another series of serious accidents. I really hope we can approve this and move forward with the traffic calming on Brentwood Road. I'm asking that on behalf of myself, my neighbors, and really the safety of our community. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that. Next, we have Christina Jones. Thank you. This is Christina Jones at 8005 Finland Drive. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mickey Fern, for your presentation to City Council last week. Your strategies are a good starting point for citizen engagement, and I hope that a representative from the disbanded CAC structure will be selected to work with the community team that you spoke of. As our CAC chair, I believe I'm a good candidate for that role. What does accountability look like? Political accountability is when a politician makes a choice on behalf of the people, and the people have the ability to reward or sanction that politician. Those who hold their actions accountable follow these steps. They take responsibility, they don't make excuses, they are on time, they control their own fate, they own their feelings, they manage expectations, they collaborate, and they don't expect praise. CACs were a foundation to build from to accomplish what you spoke of. The ideas that CACs didn't work cannot rest solely on those volunteers who gave their time on behalf of the city. Collaboration between multiple departments, including council itself, is necessary for a well-rounded citizen engagement. And I was happy to see that reflected in Mr. Fern's presentation. Council never gave CACs clear direction on what they wanted. And a year later, I'm not sure council's direction is any clearer. I understand accountability can feel like an attack when you're not ready to acknowledge how your behavior harms others. But let's look at it as us working together for the good of Raleigh. How can we help you? Our message seems to be getting lost in the constant back and forth of what was right and wrong about CACs. We share a mutual respect for Raleigh residents, and we need to focus on that. We can help amplify your voice to our current community while working with you to expand our reach. We're still meeting monthly with residents, and our audience is growing every month. Work with us and help us continue to bridge between, continue to be a bridge between residents and their elected representatives. RCAC's mission is to educate Raleigh residents on important issues impacting their daily lives. We will be meeting tomorrow night at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Everyone is welcome, and I encourage everyone, including council, to follow us on Facebook for updates. Our guest speaker this month will be the city, the chief of staff for the city of Raleigh. 
He will be reviewing the city manager form of government that Raleigh follows and what that structure means to residents. We will also have a presentation from the transportation department in regards to their commute smart program. Find our Zoom link by searching for Raleigh Citizens Advisory Council on Facebook. We look forward to meeting you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Next, we have Richard Johnson. Richard Johnson, 3225 Oak Grove Circle. The city of Raleigh doesn't have the resources to address many quality of life issues, from leaf collection to stopping cars racing on the Beltline, to fixing potholes, to maintaining and building our parks, or even building sidewalks. Yet this council, the Council of Kane, is planning to give several hundred million of our tax dollars to John Kane for his downtown South boondoggle. Kane, when not busy donating and campaigning for Donald Trump and other radical Republicans, is pushing a TIG, a tax incentive grant. This is just another tool to reduce taxes on the wealthy at the expense of the working class and the poor and the needy. And we know Kane's first priority is not to build truly affordable housing, but to build a soccer stadium. A soccer stadium for a team that has just been downgraded to a lower level. A soccer stadium when we already have adequate venues for sports in this area. If John Kane and Steve Malik want to build a soccer stadium, let them pay for it. We don't need welfare for the rich. The fact that the city of Raleigh has already put staff to work on this policy, while not surprising, is disheartening and worrisome. No wonder you're known as the Council of Cain. In the middle of a pandemic and economic distress for our citizens and businesses, and at a time when growth has not slowed in wake, plenty of responsible developers offer many amenities and successful projects without a TIG. This is the wrong approach for our city, especially at this time. We have huge unfunded infrastructure, public safety, and human service needs. In fact, just a few minutes ago at your work session, you talked about how dreadful our fiscal outlook is. Reducing our revenue stream in this manner to prop up an already rich developer is not an effective long-term strategy, and we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars here. You're supposed to be the Raleigh City Council, not the Council of Kane. Next, we have James um, Idemarco. Ida yes, uh, thanks, Mayor Baldwin. Good afternoon. Uh, I presented some slides. If we could jump to slide two, titled Background, I'd appreciate it. My name is James Idemarco. I'm one of 16 residents of Trenton Place. I wanted to speak to the J2 100% no parking petition, uh, which was signed by every homeowner. I want to thank the council for listening to our concerns. I want to thank the staff for acknowledging some of the unsafe conditions. And while we appreciate transportation's recommendation as a step forward, it, it leaves approximately 240 feet or eight spaces of dangerous conditions to persist for the residents um, and the people who come to park here. So today, we would ask the council to, to later modify the recommendation and approve the petition for 100% no parking. Let me just quickly highlight some obvious dangerous conditions, but also the ones that maybe are less obvious. We're adjacent to new developments that have evolved over the years. Um, a gate entrance to Umstead Park is right around the corner. This entrance was not designed to be a public access point. There are official access points with ample parking to allow everyone to enjoy, enjoy the 5,000 acres of Umstead Park, which we fully support. The Greenway connector, as you know, is going to extend from the park. It's going to cut right across our subdivision in front of some of these photos you see. Uh, the recently approved bandwidth headquarters just a few weeks ago is less than one and a half miles away. That's going to bring about 1,200 plus employees. Uh, you can stay on the slide. I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you when to advance it if you don't mind. Um, so, and the major SAS employee entrance is less than a mile away uh, in the other direction. One very important thing to note is that today, based on the homeowner's covenants, we're restricted. No homeowners are permitted to park on these streets in questions for these same safety concerns. Um, so our neighborhood has become a default parking lot, which brings unique issues. Not surprisingly, park goers must unload vehicles with pets, small children, bicycles, right in the middle of these narrow streets. Two cars cannot pass, as you can see in this photo, anywhere along the street where there's a parked vehicle. So where the perfect storm uh, for danger arises is when 
vehicles are trying to enter or exit the subdivision, as you can imagine in this photo, and trying to navigate around the parked cars. This is a huge issue for emergency vehicles or to access the fire hydrant. You compound this with neighbor, neighbors ex, exist, exiting their driveways directly across from these parked cars. If you could go to the next slide, please. Now on this slide, you see a string of vehicles and during peak periods, this grows to about eight to 10 vehicles creating unsafe conditions. So what, what's less obvious is that any vehicle that enters this subdivision, often speeding, will make a U-turn at the end of the street or use resident driveways so they can conveniently park facing out of the subdivision. So in the photo that you can see that the recommendation by the staff um, is going to leave parking, it basically is shifting the problem further into the, to the subdivision. Another less, if you go to the next slide, another less obvious concern is that when people disembark their vehicles, they open all the car doors, as you can see this woman doing here, they exit with bikes or pets or small children, unaware of the unsafe environment they're creating. James? Yes. I'm sorry, your three yep. minutes are up. Okay, yeah, th thank you for the consideration. Okay, did you, um, did you um, have any other residents speaking on this? I had several uh, residents uh, that are, were aware of the staff recommendation who wrote a letter uh, trying to encourage a vote for 100% no parking versus the recommendation, which did eliminate some dangerous no parking, but not all of it. And that's what I tried to present today to, 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 to illustrate some of that, yeah. Okay, well, this was pulled from the consent agenda and we will be discussing it after the um, public comment. Right, thank you for that. Okay, James, thank you. You're welcome. Um, next Mayor McFarland. Mayor McFarland, uh, I just wanted to indicate uh, I did receive several letters of opposition uh, to this that were forwarded to council. I uh, just want to make that a part of the record. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we have Tim Niles. Tim Niles, 11509 Midlavian Drive. Last week, Councilor Stewart made the most offensive remark I've heard from the council table. She said, there are folks who show up at every space, every venue we offer. We are hearing the same voices in all of these different spaces. I have heard from folks who don't engage who say these folks turn them off. Using the term space sounds as though she is offended to have citizens violating her personal space. Stewart and this council have been so successful in vilifying engaged citizens and discrediting their opinions, she now has people telling her the sound of their voices, turn them off. Well done, Counselor. This is not new for Stewart. At her renters forum, she welcomed the attendees with this. The city has been really good at engaging with white homeowners for a really long time. She justified her vote to NCAC, saying she wanted to right size the voices being heard. She is such a champion of engagement, she published a survey almost a year ago asking how people want to engage and has never released the results. Must have been the wrong size voices. It sounds like she wants to gerrymander the voices being heard by council. We get it, counselor. You think by now these obstinate old white homeowners would figure out you don't care what they think and would just go away. At least until you convince a larger group who do agree with you to start engaging and drown them out. Eight of the 18 CACs you abolished were located in majority black neighborhoods. In 2017, 47% of the CAC chairs were black. Your characterization of the CACs being a bunch of old white homeowners is not and never has been accurate. Yes, the city should encourage more participation. You don't do that by demonizing those who are engaged, telling them you've heard enough from them as Stewart did in her GNR committee, refusing to allow the public to speak. A homeowner wanted a sewer line moved by 50 feet. The move was approved by staff as doable. It would have saved trees and wildlife habitat. But Stewart, the self-described environmentalist, denied her right to speak to protect her property from being unnecessarily destroyed. You also don't encourage more participation by appointing the same older white male homeowner to three different boards. Stewart should be thankful citizens do show up at her spaces. Her renters forum was not a huge success. I was there encroaching on her space. By my count, there were 31 attendees. Three were counselors, seven staff, one reporter. Of the 12 actual attendees, I identified seven as regular CAC goers. Only two of the remaining 13 identified as renters. 
A citywide meeting she hailed as a great success had less attendance than a monthly CAC meeting for a neighborhood. But then those CAC attendees are the people she and her friends are turned off by. I'm so glad I started this by asking people to be kind. That was the exact opposite of being kind. Um, Councillor Stewart, you had your hand raised. Yes, Mayor, I just wanted to say that it is great to hear from Mr. Niles once again, um, as he pointed out multiple times, he um, joins us often. So it's great to hear your voice again, Mr. Niles. Thank you. John Sealbinder. Hello. Um, I, uh, I wanted to keep what I, I need to ask pretty simple um, and positive. Uh, a couple of years ago, I came before council um, about a food truck uh, program for parking on the streets. There are four zones. I'm utilizing one. Um, and during the pandemic, this is, uh, for lack of a better word, been a lifeline for not only Little City Brewing, but also for the Virgil's food trucks and a couple of other food trucks in the area. Um, the ask is pretty simple um, to extend the business hours. Uh, currently, they are from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, obviously, the majority of the week, other than um, a little bit of business afternoon on Saturdays and Sundays, um, are not business hours for um, the truck zone. Um, again, it's been a very successful thing, especially during the, the, the restaurant and bar shutdown during the pandemic. And um, uh, again, uh, our hours are limited to, you know, 9, 10 o'clock at the moment. Um, the ask would be to extend the hours um, past 3 to 10 o'clock. Um, we've had great response from the building that that is there, the West Building. Um, the zone that I'm talking about specifically is located at 400 West North Street on the corner of West and Harrington. Thank you, John. Um, City Manager, could we have staff look at this? Um, it seems to me that, I mean, with the effort that we've made um, with outdoor dining, opening up sidewalks, opening up streets, whatnot, that this would make sense to um, extend hours. So if we could, um, if staff could look at this, and if you could report back to us, um, probably before um, the next meeting or I would be happy to take this into committee for further discussion whatever they work best committee meeting would be more Tuesday. Sure mayor we can do whichever you think is most appropriate. We can prepare it for Tuesday's agenda and stay vibrant healthy or we can bring it back if you wanted to do it before the meeting on February the 2nd. We could do it in a manager's um, report on Friday. If everybody is okay, let's let's take this into um, committee, Safe, Fiber, and, and Healthy Community Committee, and we'll look at it. And if staff could start preparing, um, that would be great. Okay, is everybody okay with that? Patrick, I'm trying to get some response votes. Okay, thank you. So, okay, next we have Douglas. Hello, my name is Doug Johnston, 120 Forest Road. Uh, I'm interested at the moment in the edge study for Dick's Park. Uh, the edges of the two parks that you're looking at are park assets for both New York Central Park and the other picture of Bath, England, Greenbelt. Uh, I'm not sure the slides are up, but uh, you may remember them from last time. If you started with a blank slate, either of these could be the model for what you'd like to see around Dix Park. Ah, there they are. Uh, and in the background, you can see the, the edge and the edge area 
both of those features, the park and the green belt. Uh, it took a large number of different kinds of developers, many, no doubt, like downtown South and Park City South. So I'm not disparaging developers by a long shot. Uh, the Fuller Heights area and the Carol Carolee area uh, have lots of features and plenty of exciting room for making them the kind of assets, kind of park assets that the city wants. Uh, Lake Wheeler Road isn't Fifth Avenue yet, if you'll show me, let the next slide up. But I'm convinced that the involvement of, of uh, the Appearance Commission and the Greenway and the city's transportation system and all the different people that come together can make that uh, as close to a Central Park West or Fifth Avenue as anybody would care to have and certainly the North Carolina equivalent of the power of those areas around Central Park and areas in Bath, England around the Greenbelt. Thanks very much. I'll have more, of course, to say on this later, but I appreciate the opportunity to give you a little introduction. Thank you, Doug. Next, we have Lynn Walter. Good afternoon. My name is Lynn Walter and my address is 3228 Glenridge Drive. I have lived in and owned my home in the Brentwood neighborhood for over 13 years. I'm speaking today to ask City Council to move forward with and implement the final draft of the Brentwood Road traffic calming plan. My home is on the corner of Glenridge Drive and Brentwood Road and my house is oriented so that it faces the intersection of these streets. I regularly see cars speeding well above the posted 25 mile an hour speed limit on Brentwood and have witnessed and have had happen to me cars that pass cars who are going a speed limit. I've also seen speeding cars that roar right up on other cars in tailgate and other dangerous traffic situations. And as council knows, this is a neighborhood. The speed limit for our neighborhood is 25 miles an hour, yet people treat Brentwood Road like a drag strip. As you've heard earlier today, there have also been several, uh, well, multiple serious accidents on Brentwood Road. In December of 2020, I emailed photos to all council members about one of these accidents that happened on, in October of 2020. Both of the cars ended up in my yard. One also destroyed a city stop sign and speed limit sign, and the other car went well up into my yard, wedging itself between two oak trees. Both cars polluted large areas of the soil on my property when their gas, oil, and other fluids all leaked out, and they damaged landscaping and trees. I then had to spend months getting the driver's insurance companies to pay for soil remediation and removing the contaminated soil, replacing the destroyed landscaping, and treating the damaged tree to prevent infestation or death. And these are giant trees in my neighborhood. These are huge 60 plus year old oak trees. And more importantly, one of the drivers in that accident was so injured that they had to be taken by ambulance to the hospital. This accident is just one example out of many, and it is also not one of the accidents that Michael spoke about earlier. We need the Brentwood Road traffic calming plan to be implemented immediately to keep our property, our homes, our children, our neighbors, and ourselves safe. Please move forward today with the final draft of the traffic calming plan for Brentwood Road and help keep our neighborhood and us safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have Catherine Bird. Hi, this is Catherine Bird, 509 Smoke Ridge Lane. Um, on Wednesday, January 6th, the white supremacist invasion of the Capitol was upsetting to watch as it unfolded on the news. But perhaps more horrifying is the way lies and conspiracy theories have become accepted by a more mainstream audience. I didn't see anything on the City of Raleigh website or Twitter account condemning this violence and the racism that was clearly on display. Clearly, the city is aware of the issue with the post that buildings will be closed this Wednesday out of an abundance of caution, but no mention of the reason why. I feel that not even acknowledging or naming these issues or addressing them when they occur promotes a dangerous sense of normalcy and acceptability around things that we as a nation should not tolerate. While the focus on Wednesday was at the Capitol, 
these issues affect us locally as well. This is another example where the city of Raleigh claims that they want to dismantle racism, but isn't changing much about the status quo in practice. Speaking of concrete things that we as a city could do, I noticed that Police Chief Duck Brown will be retiring this year. I couldn't find anything about the process for selecting her replacement, but I think that organizations such as Raleigh Pact should be involved in that process if we are really and truly committed to addressing issues of systemic racism within the police force and in our government. Furthermore, at the January 5th City Council meeting, Ms. Edwards and Dr. McTarian came to you with a specific request to form an African American Affairs Board. It seemed like you were at least somewhat prepared for this topic because you mentioned a group of people speaking on it and you're going to address them at the end. But the only hopeful thing about that interaction was that they were contacted for a follow up meeting, which I hope happened and I hope they were taken seriously. Because what was told to them in that moment seemed quite dismissive. Here you have two women who are community leaders with a plan backed up by demographic data to form a board of the sort that the city of Raleigh already has precedent for. And instead you tell them to go to the Human Relations Commission. I looked them up and it looks like their main job is to plan activities. They didn't go there, they came to you, the mayor and the council because you're the ones that currently hold the power to actually make changes. And then to tell them that there will be an ongoing discussion series with Shaw University on racial issues these are black women, they're familiar with racial issues. That's not what they're asking for. We don't need to wait nine months to see the results of that 10 point plan when people from your community are coming to you right now with a clear plan for something that could be done in addition to whatever else you've got going on. While you may feel like you have good intentions, pause and examine the impact of your actions. These issues are not new, these community organizations are not new, and it would be good to actually listen to them and make real changes instead of continuing on as we have been and just talking about change. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Marshall, just as a follow up, I know that you had reached out to Kim. Um, have you had an opportunity to talk with her? I have not gotten a response back from Ms. McTarian at this point, Mayor. Okay. I will reach back out. Thank you. Um, Charles Brock. All right, thank you, Charles Brock. Uh, I live on Glenridge Drive in Brentwood. I am as well an advocate for the Brentwood road calming and firsthand witness the excessive traffic and speeds on this, what has seemed to become a cut through street as the people before me stated. I'm taking today's opportunity to request that the calming efforts being done on Brentwood be extended onto the Glenridge Drive and Bardwell Street as well. Uh, recently, the city has approved a 300 plus apartment complex to be constructed in the location of the abandoned hotel off Capitol. Uh, as part of this project, it was approved that the street, soon to be Aloe Street, be connected to Glenridge Drive with no egress, uh, ingress, egress to Brentwood Road, therefore turning Glenridge Drive into a cut through street even more um, for access to the apartment complex. I've spoken with McAdams engineering firm and know firsthand that no traffic study was performed to address the huge uptick in throughway traffic that our neighborhood will experience. Um, again, you'll be turning Glenridge and Bardwell into a cut through street. I know myself and neighbors would appreciate traffic management or calming efforts be extended into our neighborhood. Additionally, if possible, I'd like to request uh, that contact be given to us to discuss with the developer of the apartment complex to discuss uh, the issues with wildlife homes that they are destroying and why they are cutting down unnecessary tree clearing. That is all, thank you. Thank you, Charles. Um, next, we have Maya Covello. Not on the call, Mayor. Okay. And then we have Michael um, Lodiboli. Hi, uh, thanks, Mayor. I am Mike Ledebley. My address is 30, uh, 2306 Stafford Avenue. I'm here to talk about short-term rentals. I pose the limit for number of days that an unhosted Airbnb unit can be rented and the limit to the number of units that can be rented short-term in a building. The Planning Commission has added limits to TC 8-20 that were never discussed by Council and is counter to the goal of allowing Airbnbs in Raleigh. Simply put, these caps will put many Airbnb hosts out of business. As hosts, we are small business owners. 
The pandemic has made hosting difficult. As small business owners, we're providing a service. Ask yourself, what small business owners can get by providing your service for only 120 days per year? Do the Planning Commission and Council target other small businesses by limiting the number of days that they can be in business? Many of us are just trying to get by during this pandemic. What sense does it make to put more than half of the hosts in Raleigh out of business? The Planning Commission talked about how this limit would stop investors from coming in and buying blocks of property. That doesn't happen in Raleigh. We're a different market than Asheville. We host folks coming into town to check out Raleigh as a place to live. We host visiting nurses looking for a nice place to stay that's not a hotel. The actual number of short-term rental units in Raleigh is relatively low for a city of its size. Here are a few examples based on data publicly available from Air DNA. Raleigh, with a population of about 465,000, has approximately 678 short-term rentals. About 35% of those are hosted stays. If you consider all 678 as unhosted units, that would make them a whopping 0.3% of the total housing stock. Asheville, with a population of about 91,000, has approximately 2,160 short-term rentals. Charlotte, with a population of about 857,000, has a population has a 2,500 short-term rentals and no regulation. These limits are a solution in search for a problem. As hosts, we provide restaurant recommendations and places to visit. We employ cleaners and maintenance personnel. Our cleaner would be unemployed during this pandemic if not for our short-term rental business. Restaurants are hurting. Do we really want to make things worse at this time? These limits added by the Planning Commission are not in line with the commitment that Council made to short-term rental hosts. These caps are a covert way to go against Council and kill short-term rentals in Raleigh. I urge you to remove these limits and keep the promise you made to short-term rental to make short-term rentals available in Raleigh. If needed, revisit this issue in a year to see if there has been a substantial spike in short-term rental units and add additional regulations if needed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Member Owen. Yes. Uh, just for the record on the um, uh, development, the Alliance residential development on Capitol Boulevard, we did receive several written comments on that that have been forwarded to you. And I also received several written comments on the um, short term rental that was that were forwarded to you. Just wanted that a part of the record. Okay. Thank you, Clerk. Um, Councillor Cox. I can discuss this more in council concerns. Um, the folks that have written about the Alliance residential are, are primarily concerned about the traffic on Glenridge. And one of the proposals being floated around is the possibility of a traffic circle to help alleviate any issues there. And I was just wondering if transportation department could take a look at that option. Um, my so I'll just, I'll just leave it there and, and follow up with transportation. Um, Marshall, the transportation department take a look at that and um, report back to us. Yes, ma'am. Staff produce a report for the next meeting. Thank you. And Councillor Cox, um, will you be um, raising this issue council concerns? No, th this is fine. I I'll follow up with staff and uh, we'll go from there. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So the first item um, we had, we said after public comment, we would take up the issue of the Trenton Woods Way um, item, um, TJ um, J2, that was pulled by Councilor Fort. Um, Council Melton, I see you raising your hand. Yeah, may I be excused for a brief moment? I have to uh, step out and tend to something. Yes. Um, Councilor Fort. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, I asked for this um, matter to be uh, pulled from the consent agenda. Um, and as you've heard from Mr. Uh, Adamarco, there are several folks in the uh, neighborhood who've got some ongoing concerns. Um, I want to thank, thank staff, um, in particular, um, 
Matthew and his folks have had a number of, of meetings with the residents in that area. Um, I've participated in several of those. Um, and they've actually even been working over the holiday weekend to address, you know, concerns of the constituents in that area. Um, certainly think the proposal that staff has put together as relates to um, adding some additional no parking signs will address some of the safety concerns that have been raised by the uh, residents in that area. Um, certainly uh, recognize that we you know, still have to have some ongoing conversations. Um, one of the things I've asked staff to do is um, talk to um, the state of North Carolina and their parks department, as well as uh, folks at NC State to see if there's some ways that we can um, identify some additional parking solutions that will um, eliminate the issues that the uh, residents are currently experiencing. Um, and so it would be my motion to approve the plan that um, staff has presented to us today, but I did want to give the uh, the citizens an opportunity to be heard on the matter before we move forward on the staff's recommendation, um, as well as uh, making sure uh, members of the council knew uh, that we will still be addressing um, additional remedies for folks in the area going forward. Um, Councilor Fort, would, um, would that remedy also include looking at this, say, six months from now um, to see if this has helped improve the situation. I know that this was an issue when I was on the council, it came to my committee. Um, we, there was discussions, we worked out some um, compromises, but it was problematic. I mean, the streets are narrow, um, it was difficult fire apparatus, it would have been difficult fire apparatus to get down there. So it is a public safety issue. Um, not to mention people were coming in the neighborhoods, they would change their clothes outside their cars. Kids are riding by on bikes. It was, I mean, it was a messy situation. So I can understand the frustration. Um, so what you would like to do then is let's go with what staff has suggested and then look for additional solutions. Yes, ma'am, that's correct. Okay. Um, Councilor Branch? Yeah, I definitely support Councilor Ford in that. I just have one question, um, and staff can get this back to us now if no one's able to speak to it now, but I want to know why that gap was left remain opening instead of recommending no parking along the entire stretch. If anyone's there that can speak to that, or if not, they can get to us later. Is Matt there? Yeah, there's Matt. I'm sorry, I can't hear Matt. There we go. Uh, Council, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Oh, okay, perfect. Uh, so, so in this example, um, you know, we, we attempted to find a, a, a balanced solution kind of among, you know, all potential users, uh, you know, of the, of the public street. Uh, we did leave a, a small section um, uh, along the southern uh, side of Trenton Woods Way uh, for users uh, of, you know, the, the, the park or other folks coming to the neighborhood um, uh, to, to park. Uh, the road is uh, 22 feet of pavement and then 27 feet from curb to curb. Uh, so travel lanes are 10 feet wide um, and then a parking lane is traditionally 8 feet wide. Uh, so in this example, we have uh, just one foot short of, you know, the ability for, you know, plenty of room for, for two-way travel plus uh, a parking lane. Uh, certainly uh, understand the difficulties and the unique issues uh, experienced by the residents in the situation. So um, we, we saw this as a, as a temporary solution uh, until we were able to work with the state um, and, and the Parks Department to find a more permanent solution to fix what's really causing uh, folks to park in the neighborhood and uh, trying to access the adjacent amenities. Okay, all right, thank you. So. Um, thank you, Matt. Um, so was that a second to Councilor Fort's motion? Yes. Councilor Branch, okay. 
So we have a motion um, and a second by Councillor Branch. All in favor? Is anyone opposed? Okay, clerk, that was unanimous. Um, I hope that the staff can work with um, other entities, see if we can come up with a solution. This has really been an issue for way too long. So thanks for getting on this, Matt. Very much appreciated. Okay, next we have the report of the Planning Commission. Um, the first item, um, these are all scheduling items for public hearing. Um, do you have staff? There's Ken. Good evening. All right, good, good afternoon, sorry. Um, Ken Bowers with Planning and Development. Just waiting for the slides to come up. Presentation mode. Um, There we go. Um, start with a quick review of what's currently scheduled for February 2nd evening public hearing. There are two street closings, um, annexation, and two zoning cases to date. On the report of Planning Commission today, we have five items. There are three items that we're recommending for the February 2nd public hearing. And if you'll permit me, I'd like to go through all three of them and then take a pause and take down the presentation so you can make motions on scheduling. Um, they are Z2820 on Glenwood Avenue, Z4520 on Buffalo Road, and New Hope, and TC820 short-term rentals. So the first item is a rezoning in the Glenwood South area. It's a little, uh, about 2.4 acres going from DX7 uh, shop front to DX40 conditional use. Um, this includes the historic creamery property, and conditions on this case will preserve the historic buildings while allowing a much taller construction um, on the rear portion of the property adjacent to the railroad tracks. Um, this did go to a, uh, a review of the uh, Raleigh Historic Development Commission who recommended um, approval of the massing scheme as uh, codified in the conditions on a 12 to zero vote. Um, the Planning Commission has recommended approval on a nine to zero vote and staff recommends the February 2nd public hearing. The next item is Z4520. This is located at Buffalo New Hope Road currently zone NX3 conditional use. The proposal was to rezone it RX4 parking limited conditional use. Um, after uh, deliberation, the Planning Commission had recommended denial on a split vote of five against and two in favor. Um, staff recommends a public hearing for February 2nd. And then the last item is TC820 short-term rentals. Uh, repeals the home state regulations and replaces it with new regulations regarding short-term rentals, would allow partial or whole house rentals, although the Planning Commission has uh, recommended a change that would limit the uh, number of calendar days throughout the year um, that a whole house rental could take place. Um, they recommended approval of this tax change um, on a six to three vote, and the public hearing date is uh, recommended as February 2nd, as with the other items. We could stop. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, Council Member Fork, um, the Creamery um, rezoning is in your district. Um, is this something you'd like to move forward to for public hearing? Yes, ma'am, Madam Mayor. I would like to uh, move that forward for public hearing. Okay. Is that in motion? It is. Do you have a second? Council Member Branch is seconded. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Clerk, that is unanimous for public hearing on February 2nd. Um, I'm going to bring up a question, Ken, yes. if that is unrelated, but I've been meaning to ask this. You know, in our um, code, we have 20 stories and then 40 stories. Yes. Every time somebody Brings, comes forward with 40 stories, people automatically assume that they're going to build 40 stories, even if they might be considering, say, 22 stories. 
is there a better way in our code to define that? I mean, it can, I don't know, you do 20 stories, 30, 40. I mean, I don't know how we came about with the 20 and 40, but I just wanted to bring that up. Yes, and that, that uh, Mayor, I believe you have raised this question in the past and staff has started working on um, some thinking about a text change that would address it. A uh, couple of options would be to allow you to pick any number or to at least set more categories than currently exist, maybe introducing, say, a 30-story category into the zoning. And um, if you'd like us to report back on that, we could have some options for you probably in a few weeks' time. <clears throat> Great. Thank you very much. Okay. On to the, um, the business at hand. Um, that. The next that came before us was the rezoning Z4520, uh, Buffalo and New Hope. Um, that also is scheduled, could be scheduled for public hearing February 2nd, Councillor Cox. Uh, yes, uh, I would say let's schedule it for February 2nd. I know there's a tremendous amount of opposition to the rezoning and the Planning Commission voted five to two for denial. So um, um, let's at least start the process with a hearing on the second. That's a motion. Do we have a second? Councilor Member Stewart has seconded. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Okay, that will be held a second. And then the um, other item is the um, text change TC 820 for short term rentals. Um, Councilor Melton. Thank you. I have a, a motion with regard to that public hearing. Um, the topic of short term rentals has been discussed over the course of multiple years by many councils as the city has tried to balance policy goals and the needs and desires of our residents. In 2019, the last council took a first step to regulate short term rentals by incorporating homestay regulations, which only allow a partial rental of a dwelling unit. At our first meeting as the 2019 City Council, we suspended those rules and asked for more analysis of the regulations with, with an eye towards achieving different policy goals. I appreciate the work and thoughtfulness of the Planning Commission regarding this check, text change. The Planning Commission recommends four additions to the ordinance that came out of our committee. One, a limit on the number of days consecutively per year that an unhoused I'm uh, sorry, unhosted short-term rental can be occupied. Two, a requirement to post the zoning permit number on each short-term rental um, property and um, advertisement. And three, a definition of hosted and unhosted short-term rentals and a permit fee structure for hosted and unhosted short-term rentals. I would like to authorize a public hearing for text change uh, TC8-20 for February 2nd and ask staff to modify the ordinance to remove all references to hosted and unhosted short-term rentals. Specifically, the definitions in sections E1 should be removed and the regulations contained in sections E2I should be modified to remove any reference to hosted and unhosted short-term rentals. Section 4 should be modified to only reference a commercial zoning permit fee as listed in the Development Services Guide. The revised ordinance would be presented at public hearing on February 2nd, and that's my motion. Do we have a second? Um, Councilor Fort has seconded that. Um, all in favor, please raise your hands. Anyone opposed? That would be Councilor Cox, opposed clerk. We will um, meet on that on February 2nd. Okay, um, Ken? The, the next two items I know there, um, the Planning Commission is asking for. Right, so while we're getting the um, the uh, slides back up, I would like to say that the last Planning Commission meeting had a agenda, they were not able to get through all of it. So that of these of these two items, one has been discussed and the um, the second one, which is Z46 on Creedmoor Road was not discussed at all. Um, so Z4320 is a, um, another request for rezoning on Trailwood Drive. Not sure what happened to the slides there. Um, it's a, uh, oh. Well, we'll just proceed without them. Um, this is a case of, to go from a planned development district to a residential 10 with conditions attached. Um, 
Planning Commission did uh, deliberate on this, um, desired to have some additional conditions come back from the applicant. They've recommend or requested a 45-day extension, which would allow the um, discussion to continue to March 11th. The second item is uh, Z4620 on Creedmoor Road. Whoa. Um, <laughs> I don't know what's happening with the presentation materials today. They keep coming and going. Um, <laughs> this item was not discussed, and there's a request for a 30-day extension, which would also um, extend their deadline for action to March 11th. So that concludes uh, my description of those two items. Okay, the first item um, on Trailwood Drive, Councillor Fort. Uh, yes, Madam Mayor. Um, Ken, thank you for the presentation. And I know the uh, Planning Commission will be doing some additional deliberations on this matter. Um, you know, I have it expressed my concerns to the um, developer uh, about this particular project. Um, they're asking for 101 units right next door to someone's, um, you know, single family home in that particular area. Uh, I, I, Ken, I think you alluded to the fact that there had been some conversation with planning commission, um, but I don't think they com completed it. I don't know if you've got something that you, you want to add to that, but um, certainly I, I hope that uh, there will be some additional considerations in terms of how much density they're asking for for this particular, particular project. Um, are you okay with the extension to March 11th? Uh, yes, ma'am, I am. Okay, um, is that a motion? Yes. Okay, do we have a second? Um, Councilor Stewart has seconded. All in favor? Okay, clerk, that was unanimous. Um, based on Councilor Fort and I visiting with the neighbors um, related to this topic, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on this. Um, and I share your concern, Councillor, with the, the magnitude of the project next to um, single family homes, um, the way it's positioned. So this is an opportunity for the group to really relook at what they're proposing and maybe bring forward some conditions that will um, help alleviate that. Okay, the next item is um, Creedmoor Road. And this is District A. Councilor Bufkin. Thank you, Mayor. I move approval of the requested extension. Okay. Um, do you have a second? Councilor Stewart seconded. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Clerk, that is unanimous. That will also be moved to March 11th. Okay. All right, now we move on to um, special items. And we have a number of rezonings here. These are meetings that we have to set if I'm, let's see. Yes, set the hearings. So the first is rezoning Z21 at Morgan and Boylan. Yes. May uh, I believe the first, oh, go ahead, Ken, sorry. Oh, just, um, brief staff overview, this was held to get additional conditions um, regarding um, the design and screening of the parking deck. That has been received and it's uh, ready for action today. Okay, Councillor Fort. Um, I guess I wanted to hear what Mayor Pro Tem was gonna say about this particular issue before I make my motion. Oh, you didn't have it, are you good? Okay. Uh, then I would I move that we set the uh, matter for public hearing, Mayor on um, February 2nd. Yes, ma'am. Okay. okay. Um, is, are those questions or a second? That, that's what I was going, it was a logistical matter, so that's why I was raising my hand. This one we are actually ready to vote on. We've already had the public hearing, we got new conditions, and now it's time to vote. The other two, I believe we are for scheduling. So today is this one we're ready to vote on. Yeah, I was going to chime in too. I was just making sure that the beer on Z twenty one twenty is is it needs a it needs a vote. Okay, we have closed the hearing on this and everything. Hmm. They submitted this. Okay, all right. I have a different motion. <laughs> 
Uh, I move to adopt the uh, proposed consistency statement dated January 5th, 2020, containing the agenda materials and to approve the zoning amendment with the adopted and effective dates described in the agenda item under recommended action. <laughs> Council Member Stewart has seconded it. Thank you. Um, all in favor? Anyone opposed? Okay, clerk, that passes unanimously. The next is um, two hearings we will um, set. One is for rezoning Z3520 Wade Avenue. Councilor Fort is also in your district. Yes, Madam Mayor, I um, had it had us hold it last week because um, I had some additional questions that I wanted to ask of the developer, but I've had an opportunity to have um, those conversations and have my um, questions answered. So I am ready to make a motion for us to have it scheduled for public hearing. For February 2nd. Yes, ma'am. Do I have a second on that? Council uh, Member Branch, thank you. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Okay, hey, clerk, that was unanimous. We'll hold the public hearing February 2nd. And Mad Madam Mayor, if I may, um, can I, if staff can, they can reach out to the um, Planning Commission. I have a question related to this one, Z4520 and Z3520. Both of them had the same issues around buffering and traffic, um, but one was approved and one was denied. So if I could just, at our meeting in, fe in February, if, information can be provided on what the difference is on that it would be helpful for me okay thank you council member branch um ken so for the i don't know if you know the answer to that now or if that's something for the next meeting um you want to ponder that and get back to us for the next meeting <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Was, so um, you're asking if this is something that can be ready for the next meeting? Yes, it is. Okay. Or I, I didn't. Mean, know, I didn't know if you had an answer today or not. Um, I would just say the one difference potentially is the Z45 is in a corner that was subject to a, a very localized small area plan. One of the concerns expressed at the meeting was conformancy with the request with that area plan. Um, it did differ in both frontage and height. The, um, I think the other potential question is that the Z35 um, is uh, for a significantly smaller number of units than the Z45 rezoning case would permit. Does that answer your question, Councillor Branch, or would you like some more detail? I, I, I get with staff. Okay. We have time. All right. Thank you. All right. Next, we have Z40. Um, Mayor. Yes. Uh, before we leave this topic, I, I just wanted to note that um, it seems the screening issue about parking decks is coming up over and over again. And I wonder if uh, maybe uh, we don't need to look at uh, making this a standard requirement of the code. I, th I think if that's the right procedure, I'm just kind of interested if we can um, resolve this issue before it comes to uh, zoning conditions in a more um, uniform way. Is that something we can do? Um, or at least take a look at it? Why don't we do this? Why don't we ask staff to take a look at that? Tell us what some of the pros and cons might be and um, have them come back to us, um, maybe in a manager's report, letting us know, and then having a recommendation from them. That would be fine, thank you. Okay. We That's would be happy to do that. In fact, our Urban Design Center is already looking at it today, and they produced an interim document um, for internal review, which we should be able to finalize for your um, review soon. And we're looking both at changing the standards of the UDO as well as potential model zoning conditions that could be used by applicants wishing to exceed the UDO minimums. Okay. Council Member Knight, you had your hand raised. 
I think Ken, I was going to say the same thing I think Ken brought up is I've already asked Pat and his group um, to look at this issue and I think they're proceeding. So um, that's good to hear the status and look forward to hearing back from you all. Okay, next we have Z4020, um, um, 1912 Hillsborough Street. Um, this is also an, um, hearing authorization for February 2nd. Councilor Fort, this is your district. Yes, ma'am, Madam Mayor, I'd uh, make the motion that we schedule it for public hearing on uh, February the 2nd. The, uh, some folks in the uh, area had some um, requests of the developer to add some additional conditions and those have been submitted. Okay, do we have a second? Council Member Stewart has seconded, all in favor? Anyone in opposition? Okay, clerk, that was unanimous, thank you. Um, next, we have the um, Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Resources Bond Referendum discussion. Mayor, members of the council, this is Tansy Hayward, um, one of the assistant city managers. And it's meeting on January 5th. The mayor and council asked staff for a recommended strategy and timeline for the Parks, Recreation, and Greenway Advisory Board to supplement its work from its 2020 engagement process regarding potential park bond investments. Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Resources staff has worked with the budget and the finance departments to align proposed work of the PRGAB through January and February uh, to align that to your potential city council retreat in March and the subsequent bond action steps that will be outlined briefly in this presentation. Stephen Bentley, Assistant Director in the Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Resources Department, will walk you through a brief summary of work to date by the PRGAB and proposed next steps. All right, good afternoon. Thank you, Assistant City Manager Hayward. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. My name is Stephen Bentley. I'm one of the Assistant Directors in the Raleigh Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Resources Department. Today, we're going to cover three topics, a little bit of a refresher on the 2020 work done by the Parks, Recreation, and Greenway Advisory Board. Also, how Council may consider uh, re-engaging the Board in the next two months. We also have a high-level overview of a schedule that the Council could um, work through on how to get the Parks Bond to move forward. <clears throat> As a small refresher, the council actually about a year ago to date directed the Parks Board to look at these four items, which was the Park Board was to develop a list of possible bond projects, staff is to support the Park Board in developing that list, and the list of pro uh, projects should focus on equity as well as other factors. And then finally, the Parks Board was to collect public input throughout this process. So the park staff presented approximately $500 million worth of projects to the parks board. Those projects were from adopted master plans, ongoing community input, uh, council initiatives, and other factors. The park staff then went through a prioritization projects using these criteria. A few examples are listed here from key focus areas to, for, of your strategic plan, a park equity score, a park access score, uh, deferred maintenance, transit connectivity, operating impacts as well. Beyond the scoring of these projects, the staff also did um, uh, a number of work with the park board on um, having park meetings, uh, park board meetings of which there were five. There was also three public open houses. We collected input on publicinput.com, a hosted website. We took input via email, text message, and over the phone. And collectively, over a two-month period, we, uh, we collected about 400 comments. That culminated into a tier, uh, three tiers from the Park Board to Council last March, or last April. Uh, the three tiers did not include Dix Park. However, the three tiers totaled 101 million, 150 million, and 200 million. A list of the Park Board recommendations, uh, their projects are included in your backup today. 
So <clears throat> one way to re-engage the park board in the next two months is that staff is prepared to work with them on their meeting this week in January and again in February to look at three different areas. We will identify information and planning documents and other organizational changes that have occurred over the last year. We'll identify lessons learned, changes in the community's priorities, other key considerations, um, in part due to COVID-19 and the community's focus on social equity and social justice. The third is that we'll look at key financial considerations posed by COVID-19 and ongoing fiscal drivers that should be considered. Here is an overall schedule. We have uh, a park board meeting this week in January. We also have a park board meeting in February. Staff will work with the park board over the next two months on the topics that were just shared. In early March, um, it is our understanding that the council is going to have a retreat uh, of which the park board will be an agenda item. This will inc possibly include a presentation on Dorothea Dix Park. Uh, in April, City Council can provide additional directions to staff on a prioritization list for project options that we can bring back to you. We also would have time in May to do the same thing. And then finally, your first vote as a council would occur as preliminary findings resolution in June. That, um, that equals basically the intent and the amount of the bond, and in July, uh, the council, uh, city council would vote on introducing bond orders. In August, uh, the council would host a public hearing, and then in October 5th would be the referendum. And then finally in November, the council uh, would vote on the, to declare the referendum results. So our recommendation to you today is to identify information um, that would lead to an addendum report with key themes and recommendations um, to the 2020 Park, uh, Park Recreation and Greenway Advisory Board bond recommendations included in these three items that I listed earlier, which include identify additional information, planning documents and organizational changes that have occurred from last year's recommendation, identify lessons learned, changes in priorities or other key considerations that have occurred in part due to COVID-19 and community priorities around social equity and social justice. And then finally, uh, key financial considerations posed by um, COVID-19 and ongoing fiscal drivers that should be considered by the city council. And with that, I'll take feedback. Okay, if we could take the um, presentation down so I can see everybody. Okay, um, I do have one question, but does anybody else have questions? Councillor Cox? Yes, uh, mine is more of a concern. Uh, when I reviewed this last year, I saw very few projects for District B. And most of the money was going towards a proposed whitewater rafting park on the Neuse River. And there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty if that would ever be, even be permitted to be constructed. Uh, there are many other park needs in District B, and uh, so unless the unless the list of proposed projects is changed for District B, I would not be in support of a park parks bond going forward. Thank you. Um, I have a question related to um, Dick's Park. Actually, do we have a dollar amount yet on what construction would cost? for the um, children's destination play area in the um, plaza. So uh, the volume isn't very loud in here, but I'm gonna uh, re-ask the question, I believe, Mayor. Um, are you, did you ask a dollar amount for the, the Gateway Plaza play for Dix Park? Yes. Yes. We that? Uh, yep, currently the, the uh, dollar estimate is between 50 and 55 million. When might we get um, a, a final number? Again, I'm going to re-ask your question because the volume is not good in here. Do you ask when would we have a, a more specific number? Yes. Um, well, our construction management at risk uh, contractor actually starts this week. Um, we actually have a night meeting tonight, virtual night meeting on the schematic design. 
uh, within the next four to six weeks, we would have that dollar amount um, specific. So I would say by the end of March. Okay, great. Least. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Um, Councilor Knight and then Councilor Bufkin. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm just um, looking at the recommendations and the sort of the scheduling of it. I know um, uh, I have an interest in um, making sure that uh, where it's appropriate that greenways um, uh, new and also uh, maintaining updating modification of greenways is um, a, a priority in general. Um, and so just to let y'all know that and to ask that that's part of when you go back to the board um, to to relook at that issue in particular. Um, I don't want to go into specific de uh, specific greenways or parks, et cetera, at the moment. I know you don't want that, but that um, that categorization, I would like to be um, lifted up, elevated, uh, maybe more than and I, I, from what I can tell it, it was the first time going around on this. Okay, so prioritization on greenway connections. Connect connectivity, access to parks through the greenways uh, and other uh, other ways of pedestrian access to our parks through our greenways, et cetera. Yes. Okay. Councilor Bufkin. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Mr. Bentley. Thanks for being with us today. Um, appreciate your work and uh, certainly extend uh, my appreciation to the Parks Board for all the hard work they're putting in on this topic. Um, I, I have a question that frequently people ask me, and, I, and I'm not sure what the answer is. Of course, this number changes, but the question is, how much money is left over from the 2014 parks bond? We can provide um, that information to the council in a manager's update. Um, I don't have that number off the top of my head, but we've completed quite a few projects even during the, the pandemic and COVID year. Um, so we can provide that in a future manager's update. Yeah, that'd be great. And um, one of those projects is the new comfort station at Shelley Lake. And um, I visited, it looks very nice. It's, it's well done. It's a nice amenity for the park. Um, so there's lots more good stuff to look forward to. So a related question then, Stephen. Um, our last bond, I think, if I remember correctly, was on a proposed seven-year rollout. I noted in the um, documents for our agenda item today that the board has proposed, I think, a five-year rollout for what would be a larger amount of money. Um, so can you... Um, maybe expand on that and, and share with the council a little bit of the thinking of the department on how fast we can move this 2021 bond money uh, into projects? Yes, uh, so the 2014 bond was a five to six year rollout. Um, we, um, if the park board's recommendation was much more aggressive. Now that does have impacts um, on staff. Um, if the, uh, there are as many projects or more projects that would require a higher operating impact, which is something council has to consider um, in the long term. Um, so depending on the projects chosen by council, we would develop the rollout plan um, based on what council's recommendations are, but we have done them in the past, usually five to six years. Um, if we do them quicker and we have more projects, it would require more staff, which has a higher operating impact to the city. Great, thank you for that. Um, so I think I, um, that's all my questions. I, I would like to um, just uh, uh, make a comment. And, and this was a part of our original uh, discussion when we first referred this to the Parks Board. Um, and, and that is, I want to um, suggest that everybody be comfortable with the possibility that council's gonna disagree with the Parks Board. It is, a recommendation from an advisory board. It, it will carry a great deal of weight, but uh, the council retains final uh, prerogative to set the list and uh, make decisions about how much in total. Um, so I want to avoid a situation where feelings get hurt or the board doesn't feel like they've been listened to by just acknowledging that we have a uh, different lens to look through and uh, we're now aiming at what what were the voters approved. So, uh, that's my comment, and um, again, appreciate y'all uh, working on this for us. Okay, 
Um, Councilor Branch, had you had your hand raised earlier? Yeah, I, I was, but I read through some material and, and answered my own question, so I'm good for now. Um, the I guess if one thing, I just want to make sure that citizens are aware of the meetings um, that take place so that they can um, provide feedback when appropriate. Yeah, we could certainly make sure that um, all of our park board meetings that are online, virtual like yours, but we'll make sure that we send that out through all of our channels, um, through our distribution list, as well as future council meetings that this topic will be discussed. Okay, thank you. Councilor Bufkin. Uh, thank you, Mayor and members of council for your indulgement. I, I did have one more question um, that I had forgotten and it just came back to mind. So. Um, and this is more so, I think, a, a discussion maybe for council and, and the mayor. The Parks Board, in addition to recommending a list of projects, they also recommended uh, two possible uh, tax increases that would be targeted at parks maintenance. The idea being that if you do more maintenance between bonds, you have less need, less pressure on bond funding. Um, so I'm curious if the mayor and council wants the uh, Parks Board to look at that part of their recommendation and update that as well. And those were the, the one cent and two cent property tax increases. Um, Councillor Cox. I think it's important to take a look at park maintenance. I think that is an area that uh, we are deficient in. I would like to understand uh, other ways of funding more par park maintenance. Um, we can certainly consider a tax increase but I think we also have to consider how we balance the priorities in our city. And, um, and I'd like to find creative ways within a current budget structure to be able to fund additional uh, park maintenance. Um, and I think that needs to be considered in addition to uh, considering uh, a tax increase. It's, it seems to me that this would be a good topic for a work session. Um, just operations in general, how we're going to support um, our parks. Um, also, you know, we have Dick's Park and we were talking about how we going to operate that. So this is a, a big discussion um, area. We also dealing with COVID. We're dealing with a $28 million budget shortfall. Um, you have to look at timing to determine what is the best time, especially if we're going to go out and ask people to support a bond that will increase taxes. So um, if we could, um, I think having some type of work session discussion would be helpful. And maybe we look at an assortment of options. City Manager, you. Yes, ma'am, we can definitely add it to our work session agenda. Okay, thank you. Um, Councilor Knight, did I see your hand raised? Uh, maybe this is implicit in that a work session before the retreat, correct? Because I do think um, waiting that long um, before this comes back before us is, is we need to hear it before that in February, if at all possible, um, so that we can set up to make some final uh, directives and conclusions at the retreat space but i think it will take time uh, to do that so i support a work session before the retreat on this issue thank you yes we can make that work okay thank you Stephen. did you have anything else that you need direction from us on no, um, I appreciate the opportunity that um, to us, it's always important to talk about maintenance versus new development. So I'm glad, to, happy to hear the council discuss it. Well, and, and I think too, it, it goes without saying that the issue of equity um, is remains very important um, to us. And we wanna ensure that th that lens is applied um, by the parks board. So thank you. Um, the next item is the report and recommendation of the city manager. 
and we will have our first set of traffic coming. So, Mayor, as Will Shoemaker gets to the podium to speak to you about the Brentwood Road Traffic Common Project, in the continued spirit of time management and meeting efficiency, we only had one item under the manager's report today, so we're sort of kind of on a roll. We're going to try to keep that momentum going um, because we did hear council concerns about time management. Hello, Mayor and Council. My name is Will Shoemaker, and I oversee the City of Raleigh's Neighborhood Traffic Management Program. Uh, we want to bring forward to uh, today the Brentwood Road, the traffic calming project, uh, for a couple reasons. One, the Brentwood Road has a lot of history uh, regarding traffic calming uh, that we want to go over briefly, as well as, uh, if you remember, on October 6, 2020, you approved uh, an updated version of the NTMP, uh, where this was the last street going through that original process. Uh, so wanna create that break between the old process and the old projects in the queue and future projects. Um, and, and again, this is a, a one-off project for uh, COVID and other uniqueness. This is a single street going through the process. Usually we have a grouping of streets uh, that, that would uh, have all those touch points coming to you. Uh, so we wanna look at the area and the history of Brentwood Road. Uh, the current NTMP efforts and some options that we have. Uh, so looking at Brentwood Road, uh, it's a 33 foot wide back of curb to back of curb, uh, which that designated it a major traffic calming project, which means that it can only get horizontal traffic calming treatments. Uh, it has sidewalks on both sides of the, of the roadway. Uh, the right of way is, is pretty common, about 15 foot back of curb with uh, approximately 5,000 daily trips. Uh, this is relatively high. Uh, my policy stipulates that I can only treat neighborhood streets that have 6,000 vehicles or under. So this is on the higher side of the number of trips per day uh, that the NTMP has the ability to perform traffic calming projects on that street. Uh, so looking at the history of, of Brentwood Road, uh, this, this is all prior to the creation of the NTMP. Uh, so not sure, looking at the traffic schedule, we're not sure the date of the exact speed limit reduction, uh, but it was reduced uh, many years ago from 35 miles an hour to a posted 25 mile an hour speed limit. Uh, in December of 1994, uh, at the intersection of Brentwood Road and Ingram Drive, it was converted to a multi-way stop. And then around that time, we have uh, and have maintained and put in place the high visibility crosswalks. Uh, a lot to do with the Brentwood Elementary uh, right around the corner from this. Uh, in, in 1999, 2000, five speed humps were placed on Brentwood between Capitol Boulevard and New Hope Church Road uh, at a spacing of approximately uh, uh, 1,100 feet. Uh, to give you a gauge, the current best practice is around 500 feet. So it's a little over half of what the spacing is if we were to do a project today. Uh, moving right along, looking at the current NTMP efforts. Uh, so in 2014, a resident reached out to us and said, we think we have a problem. Uh, can you evaluate the street? Uh, staff performed that evaluation and found that the score was high enough to be placed on the list. Uh, it worked through a couple cycles uh, and Brentwood Road steadily rose up until it was number one. And uh, in 2018, council approved that list and in 2019, April of 2019, we started uh, interfacing with that, the Brentwood uh, Street neighborhood with a, in the form of an introductory meeting. Shortly after, in May of 2019, we held the first ballot asking if they wanted to further explore traffic calming. Uh, and it was a sex, successful participation support uh, ballot. Uh, the next slide has those ballot results. Um, October 2019, we met with them with a preliminary design meeting we as staff generated uh, a best practice design. Uh, we took it to the community, got their input, where they got to tell us that this is a problem area, this not so much, and we worked with them. Uh, we took those comments, went back, uh, tweaked the design a little bit. We marked with white surveyor paint uh, along the street all the proposed traffic calming treatments. Uh, this is so that someone driving it could visualize what they're, they're uh, approving or, or what might be on the ground in the future. Uh, you can look at the plans in two-dimensional and look down 
and it looks good. But once you put that uh, surveyor paint, you can really see that, oh, it's too clumped up together here, it's too far apart. And it really gives uh, the, the residents a real world experience without having to go in and put in traffic calming devices and then tweak it later. Uh, in December of 2019, uh, Based on those survey markings, we opened up a comment period for about a month where uh, we received additional feedback and tweaked the design. Uh, and then after that, we took all those comments and worked towards a final design, a lot closer to the construction drawings, uh, and originally had a plan scheduled. And we actually notified the neighborhood of a meeting in early April. Unfortunately, uh, in mid-March, that's whenever the COVID-19 effects really hit our area. Uh, and at that time, uh, in-person meetings were suspended. Uh, we took that April to September timeframe. We met with uh, various other groups that had been doing outreach and coordinated our own efforts to hold a virtual um, design meeting where we presented that final design to them, uh, as well as had a presentation online and uh, the PDF of the drawings they could see as part of those efforts to try to help uh, those who are not comfortable with using the internet or do not have the capabilities, we gave phone numbers where they could call in and request. We actually mailed a handful of uh, hard copy plans to people with instructions to call us so that we could have that discussion because uh, we didn't want to leave anyone out in this virtual setting. Uh, and that was immediately followed in October of 2020 with a second balloting effort uh, asking if they wanted the project uh, built as designed. Uh, the the support uh, met the minimum thresholds, uh, but the participation level did not. Um, so as you can see here, I wanted to directly compare the first ballot and the second ballot. Uh, for the residents along the street, we have to have a 50% participation level, and of those 50% participating, we have to have a 70% approval threshold. Uh, the first ballot, you can see that they hit that 50% right on the, the nose. Uh, whereas they had about a 94.5% approval rating, so they, they met that threshold. Uh, looking at the second ballot, uh, that 50% participation threshold was not met, where there was about half of the people participated with a little over 22%. Uh, but as you can see, actual approval went up to a little over 96%. Uh, and that, that kind of holds true with the, uh, the neighborhood as well, where we met the 25% participation minimum with 26.5%. Uh, uh, where 82% of the people in the neighborhood approved of it above the 60% minimum threshold. Um, and as you go down to the second ballot, uh, there was still a, a decent amount of participation, but it fell short of that 25% uh, minimum. Uh, but also neighborhood, neighborhood support of the project uh, increased uh, at the final ballot as well. So looking at the options that we have, uh, that Council has moving forward, uh, all three are based on precedent of previous Council actions. Uh, so the first option is to adhere to the policy thresholds, thereby excluding Brentwood Road from a traffic calming project. It would be removed from the list and it would be uh, not allowed to request a new reevaluation for a period of one year. After that period of one year, uh, any resident can reach out, request a reevaluation, and we start the process over. Uh, the second option available uh, that based on precedent is, is another round of balloting. Uh, Chester Road is one that we recently did this on where uh, based on the failure of the participation uh, in this presentation and some conversations I've had with the community, it sounds like there's uh, a lot more um, community engagement at this point, so a second ballot may be a good option to go through, and then we would use the same, unless directed otherwise, the same approval thresholds for the street and the neighborhood, and that would be the final result. Um, and then the final option would be for council to waive the threshold in the adopted policy uh, and go ahead and set a public hearing with a design review, uh, with the public hearing being held at the next eligible council meeting, uh, where at that public hearing, residents could come out and either voice their support or disapproval of that project, uh, giving council uh, one last touch point with uh, the community and making the final decision at that public hearing. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to go uh, into detail with anything that uh, uh, you have questions about. 
Thank you, um, Will. Um, Council Member Cox. Yes. Um, Brentwood has had, uh, as indicated, uh, the speed humps for quite some time, more than 20 years. And uh, uh, they, it was one of the first traffic calming projects in the city of Raleigh. And we have better standards now for um, installing these devices. And um, so my impression of this project all along has been that it, it's not really new traffic calming project, but rather um, bringing it up to best practices. I'm also concerned about the, the, the proximity of park as well as uh, the elementary school and of the, of the school kids that have to walk up and down Brentwood um, Road every day in order to go to and from school. And so what I would like to do is propose option number three um, we could reballot uh, the project, but I think uh, that will just delay the project. I, I think uh, we're at a point now where people are well aware of what happened during the second ballot. And if we do a third ballot, I'm, I'm very confident it will be successful. Um, but given the safety considerations, the proximity of the elementary school uh, and the park and, um, and the fact that they've had they were one of the first in the area to have uh, traffic calming installed and that this would simply be uh, upgrading to best practice. Uh, I'd like to make them. Councillor Cox, we can't hear you. So if you're going to make a motion, could you do that again? Uh, I don't know how much you heard. Um, I will make a motion for option three. Okay, um, to seek the additional input. Um, and I, I think that is a very good suggestion. I'm going to second that motion. Um, Councillor Knight and then Councillor Bufkin. Yes, a uh, question for Will, um, and, and I'm supportive, so it doesn't have anything to do with that. Why, was there any other reason besides COVID, do you think that there was a lower participation uh, for the second balloting effort, and I may have missed it. You may have said it was, is it just because of the, the situation with circumstances surrounding COVID? That's certainly an option. That's certainly a, a scenario. Uh, I, I don't really have any data. Uh, there was a long pause while we regrouped because of COVID. Uh, we can't rule that out as being a contributing factor. Uh, as, as a couple of people that called in, it was during election season where they're getting bombarded with mail. So there are various reasons that um, I, I really haven't been able to quantify, but that's that's certainly a, a very logical thing, a reason why the lower participation level. Okay, thanks. Councilor Bufkin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I have a brief comment, but, but first a uh, point of clarification. I think Mr. Cox proposed option three, which is waive the participation threshold and set a public hearing. Yes. And then I think I heard you say solicit additional input. Um, so I just want to be clear. No, I seconded the motion for, I seconded his motion. Okay. Okay. So, so I just want to be clear on what we're doing. And I, and I support that Brentwood's uh, nearby and, and there's no doubt there's a serious problem in, in addition to some special considerations that uh, uh, Mr. Cox had mentioned. Um, and uh, and we do uh, mostly use highways, and we never speed when we cut through Brent. We got to that. And it's a lovely neighborhood. I'm glad to support our neighbors on this. Unfortunately, there's a lot of echoing going on, and I didn't really hear what what Councillor Buffkin said, except he was smiling or elicited some smiles. So I'm sorry I didn't hear the humor <laughs> in that, but there there is a lot of echoing going on. I'm not sure what's happening with the um the chambers. So um so there is a motion from Councillor Cox um which I seconded um all in favor raise your hands. Anyone opposed? Okay. That passes unanimously, clerk. And clerk, I, yes. I, I have a question. Option three calls for a public hearing. Did you stop before the public hearing or are we going to have the public hearing? You have to have the public hearing. So okay. option three. Option three as written on the agenda. Right. Yes. 
Correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Next, we have the report and recommendation of the Raleigh Arts Commission. Um, first would be the annual work plan, and then the report and recommendation of the Public Art and Design Board, their annual work plan. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Sarah Powers. I'm on staff with Raleigh Arts. Um, uh, Moses T. Alexander Green, the chair of the Arts Commission, regrets he cannot um, attend in person due to a pre-existing condition. Um, he hopes to follow up with you um, by email, but I'm, I will go through the report and answer any questions you have about their work plan. Um, first, I uh, would like to thank you for supporting the Raleigh Arts Plan um, and helping ensure everybody in Raleigh has access to creativity. As you can see, we've uh, recently finished the work Chavis Un Reclaimed by David Wilson at uh, Chavis Community Center at John Chavis Memorial Park. Uh, 2020 was a good year for the Arts Commission. Um, just a couple highlights. They uh, worked on 23 pump temporary public art projects um, that put 83 temporary artworks across the city um, and included 104 local artists, a big accomplishment, um, and definitely got people to see art where they were. Um, we were able to open Sertoma Art Center safely, and you'll see that potters are relentless and you cannot stop them, even if they have to have a socially distant um, wheel throwing demonstration at, in the Raleigh Room up at uh, Sertoma Art Center. We're excited the Pullen Art Center expansion is starting to um, come together and has also um, worked on the new launch of a neighborhood art fund and continue to manage the um, collection. The support of the Commission's um, Arts Grant Program to our arts community is, uh, goes really deep to more than 36 organizations. Over its 32-year um, support, it's really helped grow the local arts ecosystem and is now helping sustain these organizations through the pandemic. Um, the Commission has started to have the groups present to them um, at their meeting and hearing about um, what they're up to, and they have all gratefully thanked the City of Raleigh's support of the arts over and over again, telling us how important the support of the city is um, to what they do, to supporting the community and um, hiring artists. Um, we also wanted to mention that uh, pre-COVID, the economic impact was over $500 million in economic cover, um, activity. So helping these artists and arts organizations is, um, Definitely going to be part of how Raleigh recovers. Um, Moses and the Commission wanted to share some of the really inspiring work of our arts organizations. Um, Fiesta del Pueblo had a part virtual um, and part drive through festival Fiesta del Pueblo this year. Um, the Chamber Music Institute's been doing pop up with young artists um, in parks and elsewhere. Uh, Women's Theater Fringe went virtual. Course World of Bluegrass, virtual, and then some socially distanced. Um, but we've seen our arts groups take over parks and parking lots. Sorry to show you an empty parking lot today. <laughs> um, but uh, again, um, those arts organizations are always inspiring the Arts Commission, and they wanted to share with you just how much they've done. Um, the Arts Commission has also partnered with the United Arts Council on. Um, a relief fund as well as convenings and um, adapted leadership so the groups can continue to innovate through the pandemic. The priority of the commission um, this year is really to keep moving goal three of the, or goal four of the Raleigh Arts Plan, um, which was already in motion, um, ensuring equity access and inclusion in all programming. Um, it's the commission's um, priority to not only uh, focus on this, but making sure that the arts groups in our arts community becomes a place of belonging to all. And Moses shared a quote from Anita Sands that says, belonging is a feeling and a more powerful force than diversity and inclusion. Um, and that's where um, he's mandated and the commission has been working for years to make sure 
all their work reflect the demographics of our city and make everybody feel welcome and included in their work. Um, and some images of some of the projects that they've focused on this year. And um, with that, um, thank you again for the support on behalf of the commission and would be happy to answer any questions you have about um, the commission's work plan or any of their uh, good work this year. Do we have any questions for Sarah? Um, sir, I have one question um, just related to the state of the arts right now. Um, have we done any study to determine um, the impacts COVID has had on our arts community? Oh, Sarah, you're not, um, I think you're. Oh, they, they probably turned me off as soon as they can. And you have me for two reports. Um, there is a national survey um, done by Americans for the Arts that we monitor, and that takes, you know, the big picture from for-profit, non-profit, you know, it's a big ecosystem. But we also are looking to our arts organizations who are applying for funding for information like that and partnering with United Arts um, to see um, just where the pain is and what we can do to support them. Okay. Do we have any other? Um, the, um, Sarah, could you just talk a little bit about the um, the items, like the murals that were created downtown and what the plan is um, for showing those? So they recently um, completed an outdoor exhibition at um, St. Augustine's University and Shaw University. A really beautiful exhibit um, was this select group of artists. They were all artists of color and all really um, spoke boldly about what the protests were, um, but in a way that was really uh, accessible. Um, and they all worked with the Black on Black Project and Raleigh Murals Project and, you know, this sort of um, big uh, takeaway of how do we continue the conversation um, going forward. Uh, where they go next, we're hoping there's a, a few different opportunities, but I'm not sure where the next physical exhibit. Um, there are organizations that would like to collect some of the work, show that again. They um, will we'll, we'll, we'll keep you posted, but we also want to see some good documentation so that everybody can access them. I would love to see something at Dix Park. Yeah. So any um, questions of Sarah, Councillor Knight? Yeah, I just want to say thanks, Sarah, to all you and the, the commission has been doing during these difficult times, we know, and um, we appreciate it. Uh, send that uh, sort of thanks back to back to the commission. And, you know, as everybody had, y'all did a good job during the pandemic and, and doing some of the works that you just talked about and the, and the mayor talked about. So thanks again for all of y'all's hard work during this, uh, these trying times. I'll definitely let them know. They really did not want to be stopped meeting. They we had they were first in line to get worked working again. So I appreciate it. and then we'll pass along your your words of thanks. Okay, Council Branch. I move for approval of Daniel work plan. Do we have a uh, um, Jonathan Melton has seconded that? All in favor? Anyone opposed? Nope. That was unanimous, Clerk. And then we get you for the second presentation, Sarah. Uh, report and recommendation of the Public Art and Design Board. Well, again, thanks for having me this afternoon. Um, uh, Scott Hazard, the chair of the um, Public Art and Design Board, was um, unable to attend, but um, is very um, excited for you all to learn about the work of the um, Public Art and Design Board. Um, the big, um, th this has been a big year. They um, managed 18 public art projects in various stages of design, fabrication, or installation. Fun fact, the first 10 years of the program, I think we finished 10, so that we had 18 going all at once. Is You're about to see a big, <laughs> a big uptick in the number of public artworks we have in the city. Um, and to date, we've uh, completed 14, and we have another 14 in progress, like the couple of examples you see before, and I've got better slides for those. Um, 
you've probably seen this at the Duke Energy Center for Performing Arts. Um, it is an interactive light work by uh, Dave, um, Brian Brush, and it was a, uh, uh, made possible with generous support of Summit Property Group and the Renaissance in downtown Raleigh, who really wanted a, a beacon between the, the hotel and the Performing Arts Center. It was also a big hit at Illuminate um, and something I think we'll enjoy for a long time. The canopy artwork at Union Station was also recently completed, another wonderful piece that will really work to gather people. Um, this work by local artist Thomas Sayre, um, it has got reflective um, metal panels across the canopy. It provides shade as well as um, reflective selfie opportunities. So I encourage everyone to go take a look at that if you haven't. Um, it's very beautiful. The materials are really stunning. And most recently, the Public Art and Design Board over, oversaw the completion of the artwork at the John Chavis um, Community Center um, by local artist David Wilson, with great help from the Chavis Leadership Group and the South Park East Raleigh Neighborhood Association. Um, this is a work uh, we're all really, really proud of um, and can't wait for the facility to be open to the community so everyone can see it. Um, it is visible from the road as well as from um, this the community room in Chavis. So, um, and it will sort of be a, a real um, uh, incredible addition to our um, public art collection. We have a couple programs that really feed into um, council and the community's interest in providing opportunities for um, local artists and, and ensuring equity in our artist selection program. Um, Dare Coulter, who some of you might remember from being the first uh, scholarship recipient with the Artists of Tomorrow program. Mayor Baldwin, you might remember that program. Um, she has joined the team as the Bus Rapid Transit um, Artist in Residence and has off to a great start working with the community and helping, being, uh, helping the design team really understand um, Raleigh and how art can be integrated in the project. Um, we've also launched a public art mentorship program. Ten local artists were selected to be able to work with some of the national artists that are um, coming to the city of Raleigh to work on some of these bigger um, budget projects. Um, and um, they will be getting to work um, as they're matched with projects over the next two years. Another item on your strategic plan that the Public Art and Design Board is very excited to support is the launch of a public art plan. This is another thing that's long time coming, but um, the timing couldn't be better. Todd Bressy and VIA Partnership will be working on the plan with um, the staff as well as a great um, public advisory committee um, and the community will have plenty of opportunity to uh, provide input. The scope, of course, um, research benchmarking, um, we're looking forward to some policy recommendations, um, especially how we can better uh, um, geographically distribute the artwork through the neighborhoods as well as um, increase the presence of public art in historically under-engaged neighborhoods. Um, they're also going to look at funding, um, how we can be better um, engaged with local artists, um, including expanding residencies, mentorship programs, et cetera. So with that, I'd love to hear any questions and provide any other information you need. Okay, do um, we have any questions for Sarah? Um, Councillor Bufkin. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, uh, Sarah, for being with us twice today. Um, so I've, I've recently uh, gotten a question um, I'm hoping you can help out with. Um, and, and I'll use an example, even though it wasn't specific to this project. Um, but when, when we have public art displays in a uh, commercial development, like, for example, Midtown East, um, on Wake Forest Road, just inside the Beltline. There's some lovely murals on the sides of the new uh, commercial and retail buildings there. Um, when that type of project is going on, do we do we have someone that works with the business community and the development project owners? Um, for a little context, what, what I've heard is, uh, and this is no uh, criticism on either side, but basically the business folks and the art folks don't always speak the same language. and uh, 
And the question was really, is there an opportunity for the city to help translate and liaison between the two groups and make the whole process easier for everybody? I, I think there is. Um, in fact, with Midtown East, I worked really closely with um, Regency. They had no idea. And Chris and I still text back and forth about, um, you know, it's like a plumber. You've just got to decide what you want, how much money you have, and hire an artist. Now, of course, it's, there's more to it. They did find a curator um, through some sort of recommendations um, who did a wonderful job bringing in local artists and um, helping them with their vision. Their design team got involved, too. But um, staff, as as we can, gets involved with that a lot, sort of just a, here's how to do it. There's, you know, there's always, it's custom work. There's always many ways they can go forward, but we try to give them the basics and connect them with other people in the community that you know, do that for a living. Cause um, we want to make sure the curators and artists in our community get, you know, get those opportunities that they're not passed over because the developer or the real estate company doesn't know the local arts community. So we're often providing um, recommendations like that. Um, but there's opportunity to do more and we do um, have how that could work. Um, you know, as part of that public art plan scope, but send them our way. We'll help as much as we can. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And if you have sure. ideas about how to take that program to the next level, don't be shy about asking. Very good. Thank you. Great. Um, any other questions of Sarah? Council Member Branch? I was just going to move for approval of the annual report. Okay. Do we have a second? Council Member Stewart, all in favor? Anyone opposed? Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Great work. Thank you. Thank you. With COVID. I mean, yeah, good stuff. Okay, now we're on to matters scheduled for public hearing. The first item is a public nuisance abatement um, property liens. Um, no one has signed up to speak. Do I have a motion? I'm going to open the hearing and close the hearing. Do I have a motion? Move for approval. Do I have a second? Council Member Stewart has seconded. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Okay. The next item is an annexation petition um, inside the ETJ. This is in District D, um, 951-101. Oh, one corporate center drive. Christopher Golden with planning and development. You have before you today three annexations, uh, all of which are residential in nature, all of which are contiguous inside the ETJ, and all of which uh, would like to connect to sewer and water. This first uh, annexation, corporate center drive, uh, it's on 22.64 acres. It's zoned OX7, conditional use. Uh, there's an approved development plan on the property. Uh, utilities are on site. Developer plans to construct 365 apartment units in uh, District D. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to uh, answer them. Okay. Um, you know, let's do this. I cannot see council, so I don't know if anybody's raising their hand. Um, okay. So, okay. Um, does anybody have any questions on this? Okay, um, no one has signed up to speak in opposition. We have Ken Thompson here to speak in support. Um, I'm going to open the hearing. Is Ken on the phone? Yes, Ken Thompson is here. Okay, Ken, um, I think there's no one here to speak in opposition. Are you okay if I close the hearing and ask for a vote? Yes, I am. Okay, I'm going to close the hearing. Do we have a motion to approve? Councilor Fort has made the motion, seconded by Councilor Stewart. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Okay, thank you. The next item is an annexa annexation petition, which you have there, um, as you said, inside the ETJ. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have uh, presentations for all of these if you have detailed questions. Uh, this property is at 3737 and 3851 Lewisbury Road. Uh, there's an approved subdivision on the site. The developer plans to uh, construct 153 single-family homes in District B, uh, zoned R4, and there are public utilities directly on the edge of the site to the west. And if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. 
Okay, this is district B. Are there any questions related to this? Um, I will note no one has signed up to speak in opposition. Councillor Cox. I will move uh, to approve the annexation. Oh, I have to open the hearing then. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm opening the hearing. Um, David Burkmark is here. David, are you okay? If I close the hearing, we're ready to vote on this. Yes, please proceed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I've closed the hearing. Back to you, Councillor Cox. Oh, I just changed my mind. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I move to approve the annexation. <laughs> Councillor Stewart has seconded. Um, all in favor? Um, anyone opposed? Okay, Clerk, that was unanimous. The next item is an annexation petition as well in District D. Thank you. This is located at 4022 Ebenezer Church Road. Um, the, uh, the applicant or the petitioner is uh, looking to construct a single family home on the site. It's 2.86 acres. It's zoned R2 in a Metropolitan Park Overlay District. Um, there is sewer in uh, Ebenezer Church Road and water, that, or, I'm sorry, there's sewer that goes directly through the property and the water line is on Ebenezer Church Road fronting the site and they wish to hook up to that, uh, those utilities and annex into the city. Any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Okay, no one has signed up to speak on this. Um, Councilor Fort, this is your district, are you good? Okay, I'm gonna open the hearing. I'm closing the hearing. Back to you for a motion. It's my motion to approve the uh, proposed annexation of the property. Okay, do we have a second? Councilor Melton has seconded that. All in favor? Okay, um, that was unanimous, Clerk. Okay, next we are on to the um, recommendation, report and recommendation of the Economic Development Innovation Committee. Uh, no report, we've got a meeting next Tuesday at 1.30. It's a virtual meeting, um, that's it. Okay, then we have growth and natural resources. Um, Councillor Stewart. Uh, no report. We also have a meeting next Tuesday, January 26th at 4 p.m. We'll be virtual. virtual. We're just bringing up the Community Climate Action Plan item. We will save SSOs for February. Okay, we have the report and recommendation of the Safe, Vibrant, and Healthy Communities Committee. As you know, we added an item today on that. Um, request from John Silberger. Um, so we will have the panhandling ordinance, homelessness, and then um, that third item. Um, we will be meeting at 1130 virtually. Next is the report and recommendation to Transportation and Transit Committee. We have no report today. We will be meeting on the 28th at 3 p.m. virtually. Okay, thank you. Next, we have the report from the Mayor and City Council. Um, I'm going to um, start with Councillor Stewart. Yes, um, you know, I, I'm feeling really strongly today after last council meeting and this council meeting about just saying a word to empathize with all of um, our working parents. Um, right now at home, um, as Wake County Public Schools has delayed um, opening again, um, which I I'm very grateful for their leadership um, in doing so to make sure that they protect all of our students. Um, I know it was not an easy decision, um, but just want to send out a really heartfelt um, message to say, I know how hard this is. And this moment is intense, not just for parents, but for all of us who are still going through COVID, going through everything at the national level um, and just hang in there. We need each other right now. So um, I'm thinking about all of y'all. Um, the only other thing I wanted to say was just to um, thank staff um, and highlight a few consent agenda items that we passed today that was on stormwater and um, um, some of our sewer easement work. Um, and just to say how great that stuff is, um, that it's just continuing to happen behind the scenes without our kind of having to push it forward. It's, it's always going on. Um, one of the things I'm really excited about is that funding for stormwater infrastructure for Biltmore Hills Park. Um, over there in the Walnut Creek um, area that we had been spending a lot of time talking about lately. So um, just great work and thanks so much to staff. Um, that is it. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have um, 
Councilor Branch. I just want to thank staff as well and everyone. Just ask everyone as the country goes through a transition tomorrow to just remember that we all got to work and live together and we got to find ways to to agree to disagree and, and build consensus um, and realize that just because we talk, we may not come to an agreement, but we got to still be civil um, as we move forward. Um, I Speaking that, I am having a district C meeting next Thursday, next Wednesday. Um, I will send information to staff. I've shared it on Facebook and in District C group that's out there, but I'll forward it to our chief of staff to try to get out and listserv for those who are interested. It will be at 6.30 p.m. And again, thank you for the work on Stormwater, the Bitmore Hills area. That um, creek does lead straight into the Wetland Center and the Walnut Creek, and I think it's a great start to cleaning up those challenges there. So thank you all. Next, Councillor Melton. Thanks. Um, at our last meeting, I asked uh, Council to hold our um, nominations for BPAC uh, a month so I could talk to the chairs. I've talked to the chairs. Um, I've also talked to a couple of folks who are interested in serving. Um, the work and scope of BPAC has increased and changed significantly over the last couple of years, certainly since the commission was created. They're taking a more proactive approach now on city planning issues, especially they're going to get pulled in a lot on the vision zero work that um, we're attempting to implement. Um, they also have several areas of need for upcoming appointments, um, both geographically and with skill set. And so um, having looked at everything, I'm making the request that we increase the BPAC uh, membership. They currently have 10 appointees. I'm asking to increase it to 12. That'd be two additional seats and that we um, submit nominations for all of the open seats, um, which would be three at this point. I understand it may be four um, by our next meeting. So that's my request is to increase BPAC by two. Okay, do we have a second on that? Um, Council Member Knight, um, all in favor? Anyone opposed? Mayor, Mayor I'm trying to get a question. In. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were that's raising your hand for the vote. You no, know, I I think I think this could be fine, um, Mr. Melton. I wonder if we could just hold it for a couple of weeks to to get a little more context on it, 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 how big this board is in relation to others, and um, and to think through. I mean, an even number is probably not ideal. Could could we just get a little more time to think about this? I I understand. I I've talked to the chairs about it and I, I attempted to circle up with some council members before. My request would be to expand it by two. They've got 10 now, 12. I don't want to hold it any longer. Um, council member Bufkin, um, what is your um, reluctance? Um, just want more time to think about it or? Yes, and, and a little additional context on, you know, how how big is 12 an outlier among boards? I happen to know the Parks Board has more members than that. At times, uh, it was difficult for the Parks Board to get a full contingent of folks who were going to show up every month. Uh, it's not, not a problem now, as far as I know. Of. Um, and then the potential for tied votes at the BPAC with an even number um, are just things I just like a little time with. And, and I, I think I could get comfortable with this. Um, and then, and then, sort of, lastly, more broadly, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure I want to make it our tradition that when we have to make a difficult choice between several well-qualified people, that we just add seats to a board. Um, so, I, I, I just would like a little more time to get comfortable with the idea. Well, um, I don't think this is an effort to add seats to a board for that reason. Um, I think Councillor Melton did do his due diligence. Um, but in fairness, um, Councilor Melton, I'm going to ask that we um, hold this um, for two weeks, but come with your nominations for that meeting in February. I'm not comfortable moving forward if all of us aren't comfortable. Um, but come with your nominations. Are you okay with that, Council Melton, as a compromise? Man, I think the decision was made for me. I'll be honest, I'm pretty frustrated. So I'll leave it at that. Okay. 
Well, apologize for that. Um, let's come to the, we know what's coming at the next meeting. Um, be prepared to vote on that. Come with your um, recommendations um, for, or nominations, I should say, when Cassidy sends out the forms and we'll take a formal vote at the next meeting. Everyone okay with that? I'm not getting any signal. Work with me here, folks. We can't move forward on staff. Yeah. Yes, I think you can go. I think you can go ahead. Okay. Councilor Fort. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I don't have a report today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councilor Bufkin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'd, I'd like to join uh, the sentiments of uh, Council Member Stewart and Branch in uh, expressing appreciation to our city staff. It's uh, really quite amazing how much is still getting done despite all the challenges. And I've seen recently on uh, Facebook that our firefighters and EMTs are getting vaccinated, and uh, that's great. I hope more of them will, and I hope everybody else will, will continue to be patient and support our health care workers during this difficult time. Uh, in particular, I wanted to note there's a fresh mark mulch everywhere at the Millbrook Exchange Dog Park, and we've uh, had a couple opportunities to enjoy that lately. Um, so I'm here celebrating the little things today and all the hard work that our staff does. So thank you very much. Your work is seen as appreciated. Thank you. Next, we have Council Member Cox. Yes, I, I really want to just say um, it's been an interesting week, to say the least. Um, I personally condemn what took place at the Capitol last week. It was a tragedy in our American history. But uh, I'm looking forward to tomorrow. I congratulate uh, Joe Biden, my fellow native Pennsylvanian, um, on his pending inauguration. And I think we have brighter days ahead of us. That's really all I have to say. Thank you, Councillor Cox. Next, we have Councillor Knight. Thank you, Madam Mayor. On the day after America saluted Martin Luther King Jr. and celebrated what he means to our country, the day before a presidential inauguration and two weeks after a deadly attack on our nation's capital by fellow Americans, I hope we're taking time to reflect on where we are as a country, as a community, and all the issues before us. What do we want to, how and where do we want to go as a community and a country? I think we have a chance to deal with these issues before the country now that we have a new president who says he and his administration are going to deal with these issues of racial and social justice and equality head on. Our governor and legislature must do the same and we must do the same. The new president won't change what's in people's hearts. We have to do the hard work as a nation, a community, as individuals to educate ourselves to better understand the role we're playing in our society. This country is at a point of reckoning. We've got to face it head on. We all have to do the work to, to bring this country back to listening to each other, not always agreeing, but being willing to work with one another for the good of this country, for all of its people. And I'll leave you with a famous quote by Martin Luther King Jr. that we most of us know, hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. Thank you. You stole my quote. That was, um, I was honored to be able to address the Martin Luther King breakfast. And that was the quote that I used and alluded to earlier today um, before we went to um, public comment. I think too many people have forgotten those words. So thank you for reminding us again, Councillor Knight. Um, I do have one item and this is um, a request from an organization called Friendship Force Raleigh. And they are asking that we initiate, well, they have initiated a petition to ask that the city of Raleigh consider designating one of the gardens in Dix Park as a peace garden and allow a peace pole to be stalled as a centerpiece of that garden. Um, the coordinator of this, um, Mike Rakowskis, reached out to me um, asking if we could um, 
move forward. Um, there is a petition um, that has gone out. And um, I would like staff um, to look at this item and see how we might be able to work with um, Friendship Force on this idea. Um, and then the other item I have really, um, I've spent a lot of time on um, TV talking about the past week, talking about tomorrow. Um, the message I really want to share is that, you know, our police departments have been working together and cooperating. We are ready. We are praying for the best. And we hope that tomorrow is a day of reconciliation that we can move on and continue the work we have to do together. It's important work. It's work that relates to social justice. It's work that really is about making our community better for all. Um, one thing I do want to say for those who um, are considering coming downtown tomorrow, please don't. Let's just keep things as calm as possible for those who live downtown. Please call if you have any concerns. Please call our police department. Please, everybody, be safe. And please treat each other with kindness. That is all for today. Um, we have next appointments clerk. And the first one is the Environmental Advisory Board. Uh, yes, the Environmental Advisory Board, we have one vacancy. Elizabeth Bowen received five votes, so would be appointed. Um, the next would be the Fair House and Hearing Board. You have one vacancy. Eric Colburn received five votes, so would be appointed. Then we have nominations. Uh, first item under that is Arts Commission. You have one vacancy as you received a letter of resignation from Salima Thomas. So Arts Commission, one vacancy. Human Relations Commission, you have one vacancy. Um, the term of Bertra Alcacar, Al 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 I can't get that out, um, is expiring. She is eligible for reappointment and would like to be considered for reappointment. Um, Councillor Stewart. Motion to reappoint um, Gerta Alchakar. Okay. Um, and Council Melton has seconded that. All in favor? Okay. Um, anyone opposed? Nope. Okay. Well, the next, thank you. Me. The next item would be Parks, Recreation, and Greenway Advisory Board. You have one vacancy. The term of Lex James is expiring, eligible for reappointment, and would like to be considered. Councillor Stewart. Move to reappoint Lex James to the Parks Board. Um, Council Bufkin has seconded that. All in favor? That was unanimous, Clerk. Uh, the next is the Raleigh Convention and Performing Arts Centers Authority. You have one vacancy. The term of Kevin Howell is expiring. Um, he says because of his increased workload at, in, in his real job. He does not wish to be considered for reappointment at this time, but thank everybody for his appointment last time. So you have one vacancy. Okay, I would like for us to really consider um, diversity um, in making this appointment. So let's not rush, let's, let's spend some time and really um, think about who we could nominate. I am going to also ask the board, um, since I'm the liaison, what skill sets may, may be needed. I think that that's important for us to know as well. Okay, and um, 
it just says a uh, um, point of information uh, the list that I provided you uh, of the six months upcoming appointments or vacancies. I also sent that out to the management staff and asset as they worked with the various boards and had vacancies that were upcoming. If they saw a skill skill set to please contact their council liaison or any council member to let that be known. So we're trying hard to get people matched with the proper positions. Okay, the next item is the Stormwater Management Advisory Commission. Um, the term of Tappan Vickery is expiring. Uh, she will be moving out of town in the summer, therefore does not wish to be considered for reappointment. So you have one vacancy there. And I did provide you information on the the makeup uh, and the the ordinance establishing the matrix and what slot should be filled. So you have that one for consideration. And that's all I have today. Thank you on appointments and nominations. Okay. Next, we have the delegation of emergency authority for the public health pandemic. Um, we had um, adopted this resolution um, granting the former city manager the um, delegated authority. I'm going to make a motion to um, adopt the resolution granting delegated authority to our current city manager, um, Marshall Adams David. Do I have a second? Um, Council Member Branch seconded that. All in favor? Okay. That was unanimous, clerk. Thank you. Next, we have the report and recommendation of the city clerk. Okay, the, the first item I have is the uh, it's unbelievable, but municipal elections will be coming up this year. And we need to have had a request from the Board of Elections to establish, reaffirm, or establish our filing fees. I provided you some information um, in the agenda packet of the filing fees and what's coming up. Um, in addition, I think during the meeting, you might have received a report of the filing fees of the major cities in North Carolina, um, just for your information and consideration of setting the filing fees. Presently, your filing fees are $100 for the mayor and council members each. Um, those fees were set in 2001. You moved them from, or the, the council at that time moved the filing fees from $5 to $100. So um, we need to set the fees so the election board can start work on the next election. Be glad to answer any questions about the fees that we have at this point. Um, could you share um, what the fees are from other communities? Um, yes, Raleigh, of course, is uh, for mayor and council is $100. Charlotte for mayor is $264. Council members are 207. Durham, Mayor is two, two, $260.37. Um, council members are $221.17. Greensboro, Mayor is $75. Council is $25. And Winston-Salem, Mayor and Council are both $5 each. So, sort of runs the gamut. Um, most of the smaller towns uh, around and in other parts of the state range from $10 to $25. I'd um, be glad to repeat those if you need it or answer any questions as you move forward. Um, Council Branch? Yeah, Madam Mayor, I was just thinking since you know um, you know, a city our size and, and the way we're growing, um, I think a rate of 250 for mayor and 200 for council, um, I think would be a reasonable filing fee um, increase. I mean, we're still below, it sounds like, you know, 
our competitors competing the cities here in Raleigh, in North Carolina. But at the same time, um, I think it's still a good rate and adjustment. And I'm assuming these fees help go offset our costs as well um, to run an election. So that would be my recommendation. And before I make a motion, I just want to get more feedback. Councilor Cox. Yeah, uh, for me, uh, the principle is more about, you know, easier access for people. Um, I know an election is expensive to run, and I know $250 and $200 isn't really that much money, but uh, I would be opposed to uh, increasing the fees beyond what they are today. Well, I'm looking at what Charlotte and Durham their fees and we would still be less than what they have um, charged. Does anybody have any other feedback? Councilor Knight? I said if we had to make this decision today, um, going from on what uh, from what Councilor Branch had to say, I, I love more detail about what do the fees go towards or how do they help run the election? A little more detail. Um, is there an aspect of the election that these fees go towards? Um, and you would think in 19 years, uh, it's gotten more expensive as, as Councilor Branch said, more population, et cetera. Um, and so I'm sure it's a lot more expensive to run an election, a, a, a city council election. So uh, I'm, I'm sensitive to that and want to support uh, our election staff, um, board of elections as well. So um, I would support an increase, an appropriate increase. Um, uh, based on the increase in cost of running an election. Um, Clerk, do you have an answer to that? Wake County conducts our elections on a contract basis and uh, the, the filing fees go back into their coffers and I'm not sure how it would be used. It doesn't it doesn't benefit the city of Raleigh directly other than I'm sure it helps offset the costs of, you know, elections and running the election board, you know, throughout the year. Um, but we do pay a contract basis and then pay on whether the, if we have elections at the same time, there are other elections that the price is less. Uh, it, it, it's based on actual cost and um, how many how many um, early voting sites you have, uh, how many um, things are on the ballot. Um, uh, if you have a number of bond issues that are on the same ballot, that causes the the election to be more expensive because of the printing and this type thing. Um, it uh, it does go back in the coffers of the Wake County Board of Elections, uh, but um, probably wouldn't make a dent in covering the cost of elections. No, it just really um, brings us to the same level as Charlotte and Durham, only a little a less than what they are recommending or what they currently charge. Um, when is the deadline to let the county know? Um, they would like the information as soon as possible. And in reality, we should have had it on the agenda last meeting, but failed to get it there. But they said as soon as possible would be great, but there's no drop dead date. Okay. Um, do we, I'm trying to get a feel for, um, everybody sitting out there. Um, council branch is ready to make a motion. I would be willing to second that. Um, are we comfortable moving forward today? Can I, Hey folks work with me, please. It, these virtual meetings yeah. are hard enough. Just nod your head. Yes or no, or. Thumbs up something, <laughs> help me out. So, so Madam Mayor, I move that our um, election fees for mayor is 250 and for rest of council is $200 for going forward with elections. 
I will second that. Um, show of hands, please. All in favor? Um, opposed. So that is Councillor Bufkin and Councillor Cox opposed. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next thing I have uh, would be various minutes. The December 15 um, special session, the January 5, 2021 20, regular session, and the January 12 work session. I move for approval, Madam Mayor. Councillor Stewart has seconded that. All in favor? Anyone opposed? No opposition? That's all I have. Thank you. All right. Um, let's see. We don't have anything from the city attorney today. The only item that was on my part of the agenda, you did it for me, which was the delegation of authority. So that's all I had. We don't have a closed session. So I think that about wraps it up. Unless somebody knows to have something else. I do not. Okay. Well, um, thank you. No, no closed session. You're letting us off the hook today, Robin. Um, thanks. All right. Well, um, this was a very efficient meeting, um, as um, our city manager noted, and um, I will be adjourning. I want to thank everybody. Um, stay safe tomorrow, and um, we will see you soon. Take care. <laughs>